and welcome to our worship service today. I am Pastor Judy Slater, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Duquesne, and here with me today as our musician is Matt Demas. Uh, just a reminder that we do have a bulletin online if you would like to participate in the responsive and unison call to worship, confession, and affirmation. Let us gather as God's people and worship God. Our call to worship today comes from Matthew 22. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We gather today to praise and worship God. Let us pray. God, we praise you for your wonderful and mighty works. Please open our hearts to your presence and love so that we may follow you and be a part of your kingdom work in the world. Amen. Our prayer of confession today, as we humble ourselves before God, is from the U.S. Naval Academy. Let us pray. Oh God, forgive us for what we are compared to what we should be. Forgive our lack of sensitivity to the hurts of others, our silence in the midst of injustice, our cowardice in the midst of oppression, our lovelessness among the unlovely. Humble us when we are arrogant. Remake us when we are weak. Strengthen us when we lack faith. Guide us when we have lost our way. That by your grace we may be the people you meant us to be, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are loved, we are accepted, and we are forgiven. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the prophet Amos, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. Amos was a shepherd to whom God gave a vision and a message for the people of Israel. For many of them were enjoying prosperity, but they were oppressing the poor. And here is what God says through the prophet Amos. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never failing stream. Our New Testament reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. This is where the Pharisees ask Jesus what the most important commandment is. And the Pharisees had categorized over 600 commandments for the people of Israel. So this was not only an important question, it was one given to stump Jesus. And here is the passage. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, 
an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, communication among uh, us human beings is kind of the source of a lot of problems. Um, sometimes it's fun to watch children trying to communicate what they mean or understand what you're saying. Um, I remember a conversation that my two boys had when they were little. They were about three and four years old, and we were driving in the car. And Drew said something to Nick to, in reference to see something. He said, look at that, and he started to say bus and changed it to car. Look at that bacar, is how it came out. So Nick, being the four-year-old, said, what's a bacar? And Drew said, it's a car. He said, well, why did you call it a bacar? Well, I don't know, it's a car. Well, don't call it a bacar if it's car. And it, this went back and forth between them. It was hilarious to listen to a three and four-year-old trying to communicate. Well, recently, Drew's son, Brett, who just turned three this week, said to me when I was trying to tell him something, he looked at me very seriously and said, what are you talking about? And I wanted to say to him, I know what I'm talking about, but this communication thing can be a real issue. You can watch any Hallmark movie and see the problem in communication. Usually in these movies, there's some miscommunication where they misunderstand one another as a couple until they figure it out. And of course, the movies always end up happily ever after. Well, just this past week, Steve and I had a conversation that we both thought was very clear to each one of us. Until last night when Steve was relaying this conversation to our children and I said, that's not what I said. He said, well, that's what I thought we were talking about. I said, well, it wasn't what I was talking about. And there was miscommunication between us. No surprise there, right? But someone once said, if you don't like someone, you don't know them well enough. In other words, you haven't listened to them. You haven't heard their story. You haven't listened and heard their pain, their dreams, their lives. It would explain why they are the way they are and why they do what they do. If you don't like someone, you don't know them well enough. Well, David Augsburger, in his book, Caring Enough to Hear and Be Heard, says that being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. Being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. At our church, we have encouraged couples and families to do a spiritual practice called the daily examine for couples or the daily examine for families. And it's when at the end of the day, the couple or the family sit down and they share their highs and their lows of the day. It's a way of being heard, of sharing who we are and what's going on in our lives, what's going on in our hearts and minds. It's a way of being heard. Well, in the news 
these days is Black Lives Matter. And sometimes when people hear that, they hear different things. And I heard a celebrity this week say, when you hear Black Lives Matter, add the word to at the end of it, T-O-O, -O, Black Lives Matter to. It's not that they're saying other lives don't matter. What Black Lives Matter is saying is hear us. Our lives matter as well. Remember the parable of the lost sheep? The shepherd goes after the sheep that is lost. He leaves the other 99, not because he doesn't care about them, but he goes for the one that is in need at the moment. Black Lives Matter isn't because we don't care about others, but it's because this is the need for us at the moment. And it is time for us to listen, to learn, and to lament. This week, uh, coming on June 19th, is something called Juneteenth. Juneteenth, the word Juneteenth is just a shortened version of June 19th, but it's a celebration of when the last enslaved people in Texas heard that slavery was abolished. It was in 1965, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And there are many stories about why it took so long for them to hear this message. But the celebration of that day is a celebration of the final people enslaved being freed. So in this week of Juneteenth, let us listen and acknowledge we need to say and hear the story, what some people call the original sin of America. So on Juneteenth, Black Lives Matter too. Let us listen and hear the story. The first African was indentured in 1619. But at first, Africans were indentured and they worked so many years and then gained their freedom and then were free to go and live their lives here anyway. But in 1654, a slave by the name of John Castor went to the authorities because his master was not setting him free after his indentured period. And the law, however, sided with the master. And it is believed that John Castor was the first known slave that was a slave for life. And not only him, but his descendants after him. Approximately 600,000 Americans or Africans were imported as slaves, and those don't count the ones who died on the way. The state slave population in the United States in 1860, as they prepared for the Emancipation Proclamation, was close to 4 million people. Free labor. They were at the mercy of the master to be beaten, to be raped, to be sold. In 1808, international slave trade was forbidden, but slavery was still legal. The Underground Railroad helped slaves get to freedom. And of course, Harriet Tubman, one of the most famous conductors of that railroad, is said to have escorted 300 slaves to their freedom. And then, of course, we have the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. But of course, that's not the end of the story. 
While the 15th Amendment barred voting right discrimination, literacy tests and poll taxes were put into place to keep black people from voting. And then of course there were the black codes or the Jim Crow laws, a system of segregation. And in the 1950s and 60s, through the civil rights movement, led by Martin Luther King Jr. and others, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 banned the segregation in schools and public places. This has been a long journey of 400 years, and it is not over yet. Discrimination and anti-blackness continue to exist in a systematic racism that permeates our society. And it is time for us to listen and learn and lament. There's a documentary that is on YouTube. It's a Diane Sawyer documentary. It was made in 1991, which is a few years ago now, but it is still helpful in showing the the discrimination that exists. And it's called True Colors. And in this, they set up an experiment. They took two young men, graduated from the same college, worked for the same company, in the same sort of job, and they put them in a new city. One young man was white and one young man was black. And they followed them around with hidden cameras. And every day they saw the difference between how they were treated, whether it was looking for a job, looking for housing, trying to buy a car, or just shopping. The young man who was white was received with dignity and respect. The young man who was black was treated with suspicion and was not encouraged along his way. This gives us a glimpse of what the need is even for us today. Things need to change. Laws need to change. Our educational system needs to change. Healthcare needs to change. There are a lot of needs for change in our society to fight against racism, especially anti-blackness. But as a pastor, I have to say that I think the heart of all of this is a spiritual issue. Either we believe that human beings are created in the image of God, or we don't. And as people of faith, we profess that human beings are created in the image of God. And we need to learn how to honor that in all people. And the cry now, the need now, is to learn how to honor that in our black and brown brothers and sisters. Look, our black and brown brothers and sisters are hurting and angry and frustrated. Can we hear them? Are we willing to listen to them? Can we see the image of God in them? Can we stand with them in a shared humanity? Can we all stand together as God's children? Can we love God and love others? as the greatest commandments say. Well, here at the First Presbyterian Church of du Duquesne, we are a diverse congregation. And we have put together a task force on what we can do for this issue, what we can do to combat racism. One of the things that we are looking at are ways in which we can level the playing field, so to speak, for our children and young people in our church and in our community. 
Our community is one of the poorest communities in the state of Pennsylvania with a growing African-American population. What can we do to provide resources and connections for our young people? That's one of the questions we are asking. Another is that we want to listen and learn and lament. We want to share our stories. We want to learn from each other our brokenness, our hopes, our dreams. We want to hear and listen to each other. We want to discover our shared humanity. We strive to see the image of God in all. And the things we've talked about so far doing are, seem like drops in the bucket for the issue that seems so huge. But remember the parable of the mustard seed? The smallest seed in the garden grows into the biggest bush. I think that if we do what we can, what we are able to, what we know how to do, if we do these things, God will take them and use them to the greater work of God's kingdom work here in our community and in the world. So if you would like to join us in our task force, just let me know. But we will continue to strive for ways in which we can make the world a better place for all, in which we can participate in God's kingdom work here and now. Amos says, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. We pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let us pray. God, we ask that you will open our eyes and our hearts to see, to hear, and to listen, that we may discover among us our shared humanity, that we may see in all your image, and that we may love you by loving each other. In Jesus' name, amen.
just follow me down to Jordan stream. God's upon a trouble. Let us join together in the affirmation of faith, a statement of what we believe. God has not taken people out of the world, but has sent them into the world to worship God there and serve all humankind. We serve humankind by discerning what God is doing in the world and joining in that work. We affirm that God is at work, especially in events and movements that liberate people by the gospel and advance justice, compassion, and peace. We declare that our loyalty to Jesus Christ takes precedence over any other loyalty. Let us pray. We praise you, holy God, for sending Jesus to live among us, sharing our joy and sorrow, telling us your story <clears throat> so that we can hear. He was healer of the sick and friend of sinners. We praise you that in his death and resurrection, he overcame sin and death and has risen to rule over the world. We trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and look forward to the time when he comes again in full glory, when thy kingdom come and thy will be done. We come before you today continuing to pray for the end of our pandemic. We pray for all those who are affected by it. We pray for those dehumanized by racism and ask for a true humanity realized in your love. We pray for true peace and justice for all. Hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for ourselves. Hear our prayers for those on our prayer list. As we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we are going to join our sisters and brothers in faith um, and sing, lift every voice and sing. And we are going to stand together with our black and brown brothers and sisters in a shared humanity. For this is the African American National Anthem.
It's not that other races or ethnicities don't matter. It's a matter of right and wrong and validating the humanity in all of us. And right now, it's a matter of Black Lives Matter too. Go in peace and stand for justice. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and friendship and power of the Holy Spirit be with us all today and always. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.